So we're in the midst of this housing crisis uh, with rents and house prices and everything skyrocketing. At the same time, uh, the cost of living going through the roof. Uh, and in New South Wales alone, there's 60,000 people, almost 60,000 people on the waiting list for public housing. And there's millions more people around the country who are struggling. Um, so the response from the Anthony Albanese Labor government has been pushing this Housing Australia Future Fund bill. Uh, and they've also hailed uh, this recent uh, national cabinet meeting uh, that has sealed, uh, gotten a $3 billion deal uh, with the states as, and they've, they're trying to call this the most significant housing reform in a generation. Um, so I'm here with Kristen O'Connell from the Anti-Poverty Centre. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what Labor is offering and what the other solutions that uh, should be on the table. Um, so I guess I'll start by asking uh, what the National Cabinet has offered to renters um, facing these unprecedented and unaffordable rent increases. Yes, I think uh, of all the depressing things, Isaac, one of the most depressing is that it's probably true that this is the most significant reform, despite the fact that it does basically nothing. And, uh, you know, I think like when we look at the actual substance of what's announced, as Dr. Chris Martin from the University of New South Wales has pointed out, um, it is essentially announcing things that most states and territories already have in place. And the things that have been announced, even where they aren't already in place, aren't going to make a meaningful difference. And we know that because they're already in place <laughs> in so many um, parts of the country. So uh, things, for example, like limiting rent increases to once a year does not actually limit rent increases. Obviously, everyone who rents knows that. Uh, I copped a $90 a week increase last year. And uh, the fact that it was more than 12 months didn't really make a difference to my capacity to pay that. Um, we've also seen, uh, you know, talk of no uh, evictions for no grounds evictions. But again, that's really extremely loose definition. And ultimately, if your landlord decides that they don't want you there, they can simply say, uh, I am thinking about selling my house or I want mm -hmm. to renovate it. Um, and again, the under underlying problem with all of these tweaks is that renters don't have any ability to assert our rights. And so it doesn't actually matter what regulation is in place if the onus is on tenants to hold landlords and real estate agents to account. And that's the thing that they haven't talked about at all. Mm. Okay, so one of the big discussions that's been going on is, is around rent controls and rent freezes, <clears throat> uh, particularly the Greens have been uh, talking about it, uh, Max Chandler Matha and, and others. Um, but it seems like there's a lot of pushback. Um, so I guess, why are the federal and state governments so against uh, implementing rent controls? Um, governments are cowards and they are also beholden to the property industry. People often lay the blame um, at the feet of politicians and say it's because they are landlords. I think that's only a tiny, tiny part of the issue. Ultimately, they want to uphold the structures that are in place because that's how they stay in power. Um, the rent freeze idea is not a particularly radical one in my view. Uh, we've been copying such obscene rent increases that for me and lots and lots of people like me, a rent freeze doesn't really help because we already can't afford to live. Mm -hmm. So what we've been talking about at the Anti-Poverty Centre is the idea that we actually need a retrospective um, rent cap that should mean that people who have imposed unfair rent increases have to unwind them mm -hmm. and that you know, everybody talks about, oh, well, the market will collapse, which whether or not we think that's a bad thing or not, um, there are lots of ways to make sure that people are protected. So if a landlord has taken on an irresponsible level of debt, instead of forcing someone on a low income to subsidize them and their wealth building, then the government should say, we will buy your property. We will guarantee that tenant's right to stay in that property. So everybody wins. Um, there's this conversation about rent cap is, is being had in isolation and it's ignoring the fact that there are actually many levers that need to work in concert in order to protect tenants and also, uh, I suppose, to prevent the kind of catastrophe that people are trying to say will unfold if we just had a rent cap. Mm, yeah, one of the arguments they're kind of pushing is that the rent control will have an impact on the housing supply. So there'll be less rentals because, you know, landlords won't be investing in property and things like this. Um, so a lot of the, the federal and state government solutions to the housing crisis uh, are trying to address kind of housing supply as the core issue. Um, 
But what kind of measures are they introducing around this and will they have any kind of impact on the housing crisis? Um, there's a real lack of sophistication in the conversation about supply. So more homes is not going to improve affordability and it hasn't in the past. So over the same period um, up to 2016, where we saw the number of households increase by 10%, the number of dwellings increased by 12%. And yet during that period, rents far outstripped um, wages, for example. So we know that just having more houses does not actually improve affordability. It's all about what type of houses there are. And right now we have no supply of houses that can we can afford if we're on a low income. So um, what we actually need, obviously, is a really massive investment in public homes. That includes buying existing homes and adding them to public housing stock. Even so, those things can't be done overnight. Um, and that's why private rental market regulation is so important. And particularly for people on the very lowest incomes, those of us on welfare payments need higher welfare payments because at the moment uh, we can't afford to eat or pay our bills because we're desperate to pay rent so that we don't become homeless. Um, yeah, I forgot your original question, Isaac. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I meant to come back to it and then I got derailed. I derailed just, myself. Just on uh, <laughs> how are they trying to increase the supply? Oh, like, right. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. So... Uh, Property developers are going to have a picnic with the way the government wants to approach this problem. Um, they obviously just want to see more land opened up so that they can have more land banked. That doesn't provide anyone with a home. Uh, it does allow them to increase their profits both on homes they're already building and homes that they will build far into the future. Um, it is something that's also getting uh, community housing providers very excited because those organisations are no longer genuine community organisations. They're not community controlled. They are just becoming another form of corporate landlord um, and they are asset driven organisations um, that again want to see approvals for development, want to be able to change the types of tenure that they have on the property they own. Um, and ultimately all of this again without um, an expansion of public housing and tight restrictions on private rental regulation and bringing community housing uh, rules into line with public housing rules is not going to solve the problem that we're in. Mm. So yeah, you've mentioned um, public housing as being a really important part of the solution uh, to the housing crisis. But within this national cabinet plan, there's not really any significant increase in public housing mm -hmm. as part of it, despite you know the calls from grassroots campaigners and you know housing experts and, and things. So why are the government so hesitant to invest in public housing as a, a solution to the housing crisis? I think um, Anthony Albanese doesn't want the rest of the country to realise or remember how good public housing is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, public housing benefits us all, and it should be an option that every person has, regardless of their income. Um, but again, it does not serve the interests of the people who currently control the property market. If there is a viable alternative for those of us who either don't want or need to own our home and don't want to be um, subject to the whims of a private landlord. So there's no financial incentive for the government to do it. There's no, um, in their mind, there's no electoral incentive because they think that being aligned with the most powerful people in society is the fastest way um, to success. Mm. But I don't know, I'm not one to generally be hopeful, but I think, I suppose they're pushing us to and beyond breaking point to the degree that I think people more and more are realizing that the status quo absolutely cannot help. And I think they can't deny the importance of public housing for much longer. And I think the concession that they did make a couple of months ago on providing $2 billion to states for things like maintenance um, and some new public homes is a real sign that they do feel the pressure. It's nowhere near enough, but it does show that with keeping up that community pressure, we may be able to get more, probably not enough, but more. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good that, that there's some kind of potential for some wins uh, going forward. I guess in that context of that, and uh, in the wake of the kind of national cabinet meeting, um, and uh, as you mentioned, some of the concessions that have been uh, granted with the, around the housing uh, future fund and things like that, um, should the Greens and you know other independents uh, now kind of support this bill, or what kind of uh, uh, steps should they be taking um, going forward? Look, our position is that the underlying principle that the half is based on is um, fundamentally flawed and it is dependent on ever-growing property values and marketization of property. And there's no uh, way to design it that actually means it should pass, that 
means that that money would be better spent on something like the half than directly on public homes. Um, but also at the same time, it's so insignificant that we don't care. Pass it or don't pass it, it doesn't matter. It's not going to do enough. We need to actually focus on winning the real things. And every discussion, you know, every bit of energy that we use debating about the half is energy that is a waste when it should be being used on really pushing this case for public housing um, and talking about actual rental, private rental reforms that would really help people, not just you're allowed to have a pet or, mm. um, you know, we'll give you the opportunity to go to NCAT if you are less fearful of being kicked out of your rental, which you aren't because there's not enough private rentals. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a, I guess, grassroots kind of housing campaigns going on in, in across the country in different ways, in different contexts. Um, here in uh, Sydney on Gadigal land where we're recording today, um, there's been a recent announcement around this Waterloo South uh, state that was a big part of the kind of discussion around housing in the New South Wales elections. Um, could you tell me kind of what the latest updates are around that? Yeah, it's, um, it's devastating to see the folks who've been fighting to defend their homes for such a long time now, since 2015, uh, who had put all of their hope in a change of government because the people in this government told them that their homes would be protected have you know have themselves have been sold out and it's i suppose not super surprising to see this happen um but it does again show just the extent to which politicians are completely captured um by private interests and we now have politicians that a few months ago people like rose jackson who was saying we will not lock, knock down public homes we will not um you know we will protect public homes is now saying we have to knock down these homes because we need to put more affordable and community housing here. And she's using people like me as a weapon, right? She's trying to say that folks like me who are suffering unaffordable rents in the private market and are years and years away from getting access to public or community housing are the reason that thousands of current public housing tenants need to lose their home. Mm. And they rely on us not realizing that they could simply put more public housing somewhere else, <laughs> <laughs> like anywhere that's vacant or buy private property and put it back in public hands. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's horrible to see that this government now appears to be uh, doubling down on what the coalition's plan was, pushing ahead with privatizing this incredibly historically significant public housing site. So much social cleansing has already gone on in Redfern, particularly um, for Indigenous folks who've been pushed out. And, you know, we're being sold this idea on the grounds that apparently we need social mix. But in practice, it is social cleansing. It is getting rid of poor people. It is diluting our presence so that we can learn from our betters. And mm. um, it's really based and grounded in a lot of prejudiced ideas about what people on low incomes need and what we can contribute. Um, but it is also ultimately just about buying into the propaganda that the property industry is pushing. Mm, 100%. And it seems like they uh, kind of market it as, oh, well, we've got a slightly better percentage of social housing than the coalition's plan. So that means we're doing a great job without actually taking into consideration there's a whole bunch of different options for uh, you know, renovating public housing and things like that. Mm. Um, I guess uh, just to touch on that uh, kind of alternative options, uh, we've seen some kind of uh, alternatives presented uh, for the public housing estate in Barrack Beacon in Port Melbourne. Uh, and I know there were some alternatives around the uh, Wentworth Park Road um, estate as well. Um, could you just uh, briefly explain like what some of these ideas are and what, what they would mean for the tenants as well? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward stuff, right? The idea is if you have an older home that you as a government have failed to maintain, <laughs> that you should simply maintain it, uh, repair it, keep it and not um, kick people out of their homes, allow that community fabric to remain strong. Um, and then you'll spend less money. You can then take those funds and invest them in new public homes on other sites or in the case of Wentworth Park Road, there is actually space to put new public housing on that site without uh, knocking down the dwellings that are already there. So there are so many options and I think again that just really demonstrates um, the level of commitment to this 
ideology that we can't have um, communities of public housing tenants living together. Um, there are these really, I think what most people would call common sense options that are being rejected by governments around the country in favour of privatisation. Mm -hmm. And we have seen uh, rampant privatisation, including through community housing over the past several decades. And this is where we've landed. So we're only going to see more of the worst of where we are if this trend continues. Mm, yes. Uh, I guess the other thing I was going to ask is uh, uh, obviously the Anti-Poverty Centre does a lot of work around housing and, and things like this, but also a strong focus on, you know, uh, welfare um, and raising the rate of job seeker and youth allowance and DSP and other payments and also uh, uh, making it better conditions so people don't have to deal with things like mutual obligations and that kind of thing. Um, uh, and how this kind of relates to housing, other than just the fact that you need money to pay for housing and a lot of people are relying on welfare, um, there is the conversation around the rent assistance um, as a solution. Uh, let's just increase rent assistance and then people will be able to afford to live. Um, uh, what are the kind of the problems around this and, and why is that not the solution? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, there are lots of problems with the way Commonwealth rent assistance is designed that make it not a very helpful payment for the people who receive it. Some of the people who qualify for it don't actually even receive it because 100% of a Commonwealth rent assistance payment goes to the landlord if your landlord is a community housing provider. Um, the way that, I'll get a little bit technical and you can just cut it out. So <laughs> the way that rent assistance is calculated means that for every $10 more that you spend in rent, you might get $7.50 in rent assistance, but then that amount is capped. So you can't get more than $75 a week. Um, so I don't know about how, how many folks out there listening are paying kind of anything close to $75 a week, but I imagine the last time rents like that were readily available was probably before I was born. <laughs> um, so you don't get enough. You have to spend more to get towards um, the maximum. There's another real problem with the way it's calculated because you have to spend a certain amount of rent before you can get any rent assistance. And that minimum threshold is indexed, which means every six months, the amount of rent you have to be spending to get rent assistance goes up. So 300,000 people who every six months, they actually get less rent assistance because of the way that works. Right. Um, ultimately, the Commonwealth rent assistance just sets welfare recipients up to be a money laundering device for private landlords. At the moment, just through welfare recipients who receive Commonwealth rent assistance, the government is transferring about $15 billion a year of income support payments straight to private landlords and community housing landlords. So that's $15 billion a year that either could be spent on public housing or could be spent on giving us livable income support payments. And the final thing I would just say to, dem to illustrate um, this point is that if the government did what some people are calling for and doubled Commonwealth rent assistance, you would see some community housing providers go from currently maybe getting 150 a week rent to getting around 350 a week rent. That's because there's other settings at play there. Mm. Um, what you would see if we didn't do that is that 150 a week might go to like 200 a week, but welfare recipients would get a significant increase in our payment if instead of providing that figure in rent assistance, it was provided as a base rate increase. So that's why we say there is no welfare recipient who will be better off with a rent assistance increase compared to a base rate increase. Mm. And the other problem, of course, is that there are so many people who are renting, as well as people who have other housing costs, like rates if they're a homeowner or a mortgage, who don't get rent assistance and still can't afford housing. So um, yeah, it's, it's a complicated payment. It's a badly designed payment. It's landlord friendly, and it doesn't help the people that those who advocate for it claim to want to help. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that's I'll a great... i the last bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, that no, that was a, a really good explanation. Um, I guess uh, that's all my all the questions I had. Was there, was mm -hmm. there anything else you wanted to say? And also, if people wanting to uh, follow the Anti-Poverty Centre's work or the work that you're doing, uh, where can they find that um, mm -hmm. online? Yeah, I suppose the thing I'd like people to think about is that when you hear criticisms of um, ambitious policy proposals to think about it in a slightly more holistic way. 
People say you can't have a rain cap because standards will fall. And that's okay because we can just regulate to prevent standards falling, right? There's always a solution. So look for ambitious solutions and then find more ambitious solutions to solve any potential flaws. Um, people can visit our website, antipovertycenter.org to learn more about us. Um, we're an organization that is run by welfare recipients and people on low incomes to advocate for ourselves. Um, we run entirely on uh, crowdfunding and community donations. So if folks have something to spare, um, that's always welcome, but we know it's a cost of living crisis that's hitting people well up the income scale. Um, we're on social media on all the main platforms and our handle is at antipovertycent because that's the longest handle you can get on Twitter. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Kristen. Uh, if people want to read more about our coverage on Green Left uh, about these issues, you can head to greenleft.org.au. And if you could become a supporter, that's always very appreciated because we're just like the Anti-Poverty Centre run on kind of uh, people power um, and we need your support to continue doing this kind of work. Um, so you can either become a supporter for $5 a month or donate to our fighting fund at uh, greenleft.org.au slash support. Um, and thanks again, Kristen. It was great. Thanks, Isaac.